Well, good evening and welcome, all you Palisades history buffs. Such a pleasure to have you joining us after the weird COVID experience. Uh, and what an amazing turnout this evening. It's almost standing room only here tonight. Thankfully, we didn't have to deal with the rain on the way over. We're getting a respite for at least a few days, which is kind of important because I think we're probably going to need a few more days to finish the arc before the next <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How do you do? My name is Patrick Healy, recently retired news reporter from NBC4. Uh, no experience with comedy, you should just note it, but <laughs> 38 years resident of Pacific Palisades. And uh, I have given up breaking news. Uh, no more standing out in the rain saying, yes, it's still raining, back to you. <laughs> But in its place, I have had the privilege of being accepted as a member of the Board of Directors of the Pacific Palisades Historical Society. What a treat for me. What a wonderful group of people. And uh, if I could, I'd like to run through real quick the membership. Some of them are still working out in the lobby. One of them over here is getting ready to spellbind us this evening. <laughs> Some of the illness are not able to join us. But Anthea Raymond, Bill Bruns, Donna Vaccarino, Eric Dugdale, Harris Smith, Shirley Hagstrom, Chickie Jensen, and alas, one of those under the weather is our president, Barbara Cohn. But please join me if you would in uh, including them, giving them a uh, hand this evening. Such, such a wonderful group of people. Their enthusiasm is contagious. Uh, and if I may share a pro tip with you, if you have not yet already joined the Historical Society, now is a great time, and, and you can do so in the lobby after the program this evening. I promise, I guarantee, in fact, a money-back guarantee, <laughs> you are in for a fun and fascinating evening as we resume the Lorraine Oceans Lecture Series, a legacy of a remarkable Palisadian, the Lake Lorraine Oceans, whose contributions to the Palisades through her service, through her advocacy, made a tremendous impression on this community. And in fact, that, that legacy is alive today. A big part of it is this lecture series, made possible by a generous grant from her family. Speaking of home, we are blessed this evening that Lorraine's daughter, Dr. Thalia, written pronunciation, written pronunciation, Anagnos, all of that. Thalia Anagnos made the trip down from the Bay Area to join us this evening. And Dr. Anagnos, if you would be so kind to come forward, if you would, this morning. This woman has a remarkable resume of her own, a doctorate in engineering from Stanford, professorship at Cal State University, San Jose, where now you're a vice provost. Hold, hold that thought one second. You don't know this, but we want to give you a small token of our esteem, which I have hidden back here. Have you seen one of these now? I have. You know what it is? I do. It's a blanket that all the cool people are getting. <laughs> because on its panels, it depicts the history of the Palisades. So please, on behalf of the, of the Board of the Historical Society, a small token. And I know you have a few thoughts to share with yeah. us, so the yeah. microphone is yours. I'll take that from you. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here, and I am so excited about that blanket. I came down for the uh, the hundredth um, centennial celebration uh, last May, and was lusting after those, but I didn't buy one. So I'm just delighted. I'm, I'm very, I'm very, very excited. Um, anyway, I am Thalia Nagnos, and I am Lorraine Ocean's daughter, and I am delighted to be here. For you. Um, for those of you who knew Lorraine, is, is anyone here, any of you who knew Lorraine? Can you raise your hand? Okay, so there are a few of you who, who remember my mother. You will recall that she was brimming with energy, was not shy to share her opinions, 
And once she committed to a cause, she, you could rely on her 100%. She loved the Palisades Historical Society, and she served on its board for uh, years, and then as its president from 2001 to 2003. Um, giving back was part of Lorraine's DNA. For as long as I can remember, she was an activist for causes that she believed in, ranging from women's rights to civil rights, to the Vietnam War, to the LA, LA Unified uh, Teachers Union, to saving the Santa Monica Mountains, to working with Palisadians for Peace to inform young people about their right to opt out of the military, and the list goes on. And that's a picture of her right there working for Palisadians for Peace. She was a trailblazer. Many times she made a leap of faith and broke norms in order to live the kind of life that was really meaningful to her. And Elizabeth, you could change this life. Um, although she was raised in a very small town in the Deep South in the 1920s and 30s, she really broke the mold of a Southern Belle. I have my theories about this. <laughs> First, as the oldest of four children, that's my mom on the right there in the, in what she used to call her beach pajamas, um, uh, she, she was often in charge of the younger three siblings. And this set the foundation at a young age for the leadership skills that she frequently exhibited in later life. Um, change the slide. Second, the racism and segregation of the South shaped her personal beliefs and actions regarding social justice. She told me that from a very young age, she was bothered by the extreme inequities that she saw all around her. Next slide. Third, her father, he was not a progressive man, but miraculously, um, he sent her off at the age of 16 to attend Huntington College, which was a small, all-women's college in Montgomery, Alabama. Women, especially from a small town in, the, in southern Georgia, didn't go to college in those days. And this was a gift that changed the course of her life. At Huntington, she was able to get out of that stifling atmosphere of small town Georgia and meet new people and learn about other cultures and ways of thinking. No surprise that as a student, she was a member of the International Relations Club and the president of the Brannan Historical Society. All appropriate. <laughs> uh, change the slide. Um, fourth, Lorraine was um, shocked by America's entry into the war and disturbed by the oppression and displacement of the Jews in Europe. Huntington College was near Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, and there was a lot of socializing uh, between the Air Cadets and the Huntington students. Through this interchange, the students got a front row seat on some of the impacts of the war. And my uncle recently told me that my mom had a serious boyfriend from Maxwell Air Force Base who was sent to Europe and killed on his first mission. It is possible that these experiences motivated Lorraine to want to help with the war effort. Much to her father's chagrin, when she graduated from Huntington in 1944, she joined the waves, and instead of returning to Blakely, Georgia, um, she, she soon was stationed in Washington, D.C., helping to decode secret messages from the Germans and Italians. Working in the naval intelligence with, accompl uh, with accomplished professors from Harvard and Princeton, which she was just like in awe of, uh, changed her perceptions of what she could do with her life. And I think this uh, made attending graduate school a possibility in her mind. Uh, next slide. After the war, so many GIs were returning from Europe, attending college on the GI Bill, that Lorraine was unable to get into graduate school on the East Coast. Undaunted, and now a seasoned adventurer, uh, she made the decision to travel across the country alone on a train to attend UCLA. There she earned an MA in French, earned a teaching credential, and started her 50 plus year as a distinguished language teacher who loved and was loved by her students. Um, last slide. Um, at UCLA, she met Eris Agnos, that's my father, a recent immigrant from Greece. They married and bought a house in the Palisades with a view not unlike one you would see on a Greek island. Unfortunately, they divorced when I was a baby, but Lorraine met and married Ned Oceans. That's Ned right there. Um, and we all spent the next 50 plus years enjoying our time together as a family in the Palisades. This evening's talk 
about Potrero Canyon covers a topic my mother would really have loved. She would love to, she loved Randy. She loved, she talked about Randy all the time. And she was in love with the natural beauty of the Palisades and the Santa Monica Mountains. She was an active member of the Temesco Canyon Association and a regular on their informative hikes. She also loved history and, sh and continued to share with me stories of the early days of the Palisades. I am so delighted to be here with you tonight to be able to share this uh, special moment with you and um, to, to enjoy the great work of the Palisades Historical Society and the work that it does to preserve the history of this magical place. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Excuse cool. me, one more moment. Got one more drop to bring out. Uh, I should mention uh, that we uh, have more than that one uh, historical blanket in the lobby. They are available for purchase after the program, as is the beautiful Centennial magazine. Hi, it depicts the first hundred years of the Palisades and pictures and historical photographs, lovingly put together by Bill Brunson and his crew. Uh, you get one yeah. For us. Yeah. Who is it? Just a couple of more quick announcements before we get to our main event. Um, all of you, of course, know Will Rogers Park and the uh, ranch house of Will Rogers. Uh, well, it turns out that they lost a few docents during COVID. So if any of you love that place, and I know most of us do, they're looking for docents. Bill Hamm is out in the lobby. And uh, I'm in the back, I'm a new interpreter. Please come and take the tour. If you haven't taken the tour, Bill Rogers. We really need some it came up for a second. Uh, I think it was uh, wait, wait. Yeah, special events. Randy wait. Young came to our Christmas party and talked about the Young Christmas Club the and Rustic Canyon, yeah. which Will Rogers was okay. okay. So Bill can fill you in after, after the program. Be sure to look him up. Okay. Uh, and one more thank you. Uh, we would be remiss if not thanking our uh, we plug it in. It, let's. I think they turned the campus. I turned the um, pillars of this community, long standing, in this very special location right adjacent to the Fountain Oak Island. And, you know, think about it. How many neighborhoods are blessed with live community okay. theater of this caliber? Uh -huh. it's, it's just amazing. They're producing five different to, to make it this going. season. Uh, yeah, the hold current it down. production, Other Desert Cities, uh, opens just over the weekend. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, in it's fact, on the wind, right behind this the uh, screen. Right. That's, so that's part of the uh, up I think stage. It's um, okay, here. It's going to continue on Fridays, okay. Saturdays, now. and Sundays through Feb 18. Mm -hmm. I have a chance to catch the show on the weekend. It's, it's really fabulous. Yeah, so I, so I, I would recommend yeah, that you come on back. But, uh, whoa, I'm, I'm getting way ahead of myself here. We've got yeah, an amazing pops. program okay, this evening. Yeah, there we go. So let's talk oh. about what's oh, on the agenda tonight. Okay. It's the tumultuous saga of Petrero Canyon. <laughs> The problematic but prized piece of real estate right in the heart of our community, arguably a geologic disaster, and now it's the home of our newest park. It is absolutely amazing, but this did yeah, not yeah, that may, that may check. decades of dedication and hard work. And let me ask you, didn't all of us wonder if that parade of dump trucks, the parade of dump trucks would ever come to an end? <laughs> yeah, it was quite an issue for a while. Well, our resident historical society curator and board member got involved early on. He was driven by his commitment to making sure that progress remembers our history and also his firm belief that open space here where the mountains meet the sea is worth going to the map for. And of course, you know who I'm talking about. Randy Young, lifelong Palisadian. He acquired his passion for this community at an early age, nurtured by his remarkable mother, herself a Palisades icon, Betty Lou Young. Randy, an expert photographer, brings so many talents to the table. Uh, he's had a hand in half a dozen books on the history of our region. Uh, I think my favorite may be the uh, street names of the Palisades. It has so many great insights. And uh, if I may brag, uh, Randy served as the expert voice 
in the video history of the Palisades that I put together uh, just last year from the perspective of the founding Methodist Church. Uh, Randy really knows his stuff. He is such a great asset for this community. And so when I say that Randy got involved, stepped into the breach in Petrero Canyon, what a breach that was. And uh, well, let me ask you again, uh, the prolonged crisis in dealing with that canyon. There have got to be some folks here in the audience who remember that. Raise your hand if you remember that. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, Randy's laughing at me right now. That was a pretty obvious one. But, oh my God, I'm going to let Randy tell the story, but just the highlights, just enormous erosion problems. Uh, there were, you know, especially during heavy rains, there were uh, collapsing hillsides, uh, failing slopes, uh, houses up on the rim, they were undercut, and in some cases, spoiler alert, some of those houses cracked and just slid all the way down to their doom at the bottom. It was quite the horrendous situation. Serious stuff. Clearly, the city of Los Angeles had to do something. But what exactly, and where would that lead? Mm -hmm. Well, Randy became a leader in nudging and pushing to shape the evolving vision. Don't blame me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Randy did his best. <laughs> and I have to say, and I'm going to throw out a couple of phrases that sound like gobbledygook, but they really have meaning. Randy was served by ecological authenticity and community benefit. Those were his North Star as he pushed this project to try to get it going in the right direction. We've often seen Randy advocating at community council, at coastal commission meetings. More often, we've seen Randy pulling that shovel out of the back of his Jeep, <laughs> grabbing other supplies to do habitat restoration on our beloved canyons. Tonight, you may not recognize Randy without his shovel. <laughs> But I think we can all agree he does clean up well. Oh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to present to you Mr. Randy Young. Aw, shucks. <laughs> no, I'm kind of a nasty person. That's why I'm dealing with this canyon. I mean, it's one of the most surreal things is that here we have a canyon called Petrero Canyon, but most of it is gone. I mean, it's kind of like we're going to be doing forensics. You know, there's a chalk line around this canyon someplace. And it's, it's a, a, a history of how man, it was considered this canyon in the way. And so, uh, in a strange way, my participation has, I kind of got near the issue as community council chairman. And at the time, all the canyons were disappearing. It was, uh, I uh, did a, 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 an event uh, on the ecolo uh, ecology of Southern California. And what happens is, is my, the head of, uh, um, you know, what my idea was, was that all of California always moved to beautiful places, and then it would move, and they'd fill it in. So, and they'd move here for the mountains and things, and then they'd make Kansas out of it. And so, this is a story just of this one canyon, which is, in the heart of our town. Okay, let's, now I have to turn this damn thing on. Okay, there. Okay, so this is the earliest picture I know of the canyon. Uh, it's about 1893, and it's when they put in the train. They were going to have the port of LA was going to be in Pacific Palisades. Uh, Huntington, uh, uh, Henry Huntington wanted to bully uh, uh, California and LA and said, I'm going to make the port. 
And so they were going to build a huge breakwater and they built a mile long pier. Well, looking uh, 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 from the mile long pier, and by the way, uh, my projector is brand new and a uh, new program, and it decided to shuffle. Probably AI is involved. <laughs> uh, uh, so you, I'll warn you, there, there's one area where it's been AI'd. So, <laughs> but, uh, uh, so this is looking toward the canyon, and you can see how steep it is. It's really quite extraordinary. And uh, uh, they used to uh, do a lot of westerns. Uh, uh, William S. Hart had his first, fo his first uh, uh, film studio here. And so you can see this sucker was huge. And it was a, a monument on the coast. I mean, people used to come and fish. And, uh, but poor Mr. Huntington lost his Supreme Court battle. The, the Supreme Court ruled that he could not dictate uh, basically uh, uh, giant facilities like this. Uh, but he spent a lot of money on it. It's quite spectacular. And a whole world, a little community, uh, uh, rose up around it. And you can see in the early uh, uh, grant maps, you can just see, let me see, that's right. Oops, sorry. I'll be struggling with this all the time. Right here, here here's Santa Monica Canyon. There's the bottom of Santa Monica Canyon. Right here is, and you can see that the pier has gone in at this time, the Long Wharf. And so it was really uh, uh, kind of at that time, it was kind of betwixt and between. It was in a rural area. There was nothing here. Uh, but a community did form around its base. Uh, 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 and so you can see the pier in the background. And this was a Japanese fishing village. In fact, uh, uh, Sesha Hayakawa, the very famous Japanese actor, lived in this town. And Thomas Ince made films for the Japanese market here. Just because there was a Japanese population fishing. Uh, and it, it, they had, uh, it was uh, this incredible little town. And th there was, uh, uh, um, I think they had over 200 people living there. And uh, uh, there, George Freeth, who's a very famous early surfer, uh, uh, supposedly came and saved one of the, the, the town members. And uh, they uh, ended up, uh, uh, quote unquote, naming the town after him. Though I haven't seen him assigned to that. <laughs> Uh, it, it burned in the 1920s, 21, 22, and which was sort of sad because they were uh, uh, there just by the behest of the Santa Monica Land and Water Company anyway. So they, they had to move. Uh, by the way, there will be another little set of si slides a little further on, so it's not a deja vu, it's that AI. <laughs> But so, so they also used, as I mentioned, they had uh, this, uh, uh, the uh, Thomas Ince film studio was one of the earliest film stu studios in California and one of the biggest. Uh, very, very advanced. And uh, uh, so they would, uh, 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 they had movie studio using the, the landscape all over town. The next group to come were the Methodists. Uh, and this dream community was going to be this Christian and uh, wonderful place. And boy, did they blow it. <laughs> well, at least they put together the infrastructure. In fact, you couldn't buy your house. You, know, they, you chose lots, but it was basically a lease. And they wanted to control the community. They didn't want demon alcohol. They did not want the House of Lee. Damn them. <laughs> no fun at all. OK, now here we are. We have the canyon. Because remember, we're not going to see it for very long. Right here is the canyon. Notice how it comes up in two parts. We're kind of at Peace Hill, uh, um, and 
we're looking down. And so right here is the canyon. Right here is Monument. Monument comes right here. Mr. Caruso's right about there. Uh, the business block is right about there. Uh, and then it, it goes on. Well, you can see it's just a drainage ditch. I mean, it's not, it doesn't have a stream. Keep that in mind. That's going to become important. Um, and what you have is this, uh, uh, this kind of, it's in the way thing about it. Okay, but here comes the horse teams. This upper part of the canyon was filled in with horse teams uh, using Fresnos, scrapers. And uh, uh, there's one other thing in this thing. Right there, do you see that? That's the reason why we're a part of LA. That's the water line. It was put in in 1916. That is why we're a part of, not Santa Monica, we're part of LA because of the water. Uh, right here is where the park is, right there, Palisades Recreation. Now, again, we're, we're talking about a murder of a canyon here, so you're going to see all the forensic pictures as we go along. Okay, this uh, aerial is about 1923. Again, the, here's the base of the canyon right here. This is where the sunspot wa was. There, that is Via de la Paz. Now, if you notice, see this road right here? People used to drive down Via de la Paz to the ocean, and they weren't drunk and over the edge. Uh, it, it is, so uh, down, you see, they haven't built the business block yet. Okay, this is when the business block is built. Also, the school went in. Right there are the first school buildings. Uh, so, and, but you can see, there's always, the, in, in the Palisades, there's always been piles of dirt. <laughs> Even now, <laughs> there are just piles of dirt all over. Here's, here's Via de la Paz. Well, golly, why isn't it there anymore? <laughs> well, underline is the sinister thing. I, I was once told that, you know, people in the Palisades should have their addresses put on in Velcro. So as it moves down the street, you can just move it over the next. <laughs> Any real estate people here? <laughs> Here's the one where they put it out of line. So uh, thank you, uh, AI. That's the perfect place for... There, we're back to the Japanese village. Deja vu. And there we go. Deja vu. <laughs> Deja vu. Okay, so here we are. There was a master plan to this town, and it was done by one of the most famous uh, design firms for communities, the Olmsted Brothers. The original plan was that this is uh, uh, where, oops, excuse me, so, 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 premature evacuation. Okay, right here, see this lake there? There was supposed to be a lake in town. This is the sushi restaurant for Caruso's, right about there. Right about there is where his creepy father in the bronze body, right over there. <laughs> he, he probably has a hit out on me right now just for saying that. <laughs> so here we are, and this is Sunset, right? It's Beverly Boulevard at the time. Right there was, get this, a planned train. Uh, this is the business block here. That's uh, the Santa Monica Land and Water Company building. Okay, so what's interesting is how this lake right there was on the old canyon. It's part of the old stream. Now, also, in the original plans, this is the original rendering for the community, there's something that 
they left open. Along the sides of the canyons was supposed to be park land. That you didn't build a house here, it was preserve the views, but also canyon slide. So even way back, this, this rendering was about 1922. So there's this wonderful, beautiful vision of us with the houses, you know, kind of looking out in, into the beautiful ocean, which it is. Palisades is gorgeous. But there's this damn canyon in the way. <laughs> So, this is 1926, and this is an article talking about how the business area is going to be expanded by filling a canyon in, called Petrero. Also, at the bottom, they started to build, and they started to slice. If you notice, this hillside is just completely sliced. We Everything we do to these slopes destabilizes them. And in California law, they have a, a little thing that says anybody who, who changes below is responsible legally to the above. Keep that in mind. <laughs> so by the way, that, that, that I remember this as the sunspot. Uh, uh, it was the, uh, originally Nina's. It was, it was actually an architectural masterpiece, but boy, it kind of fell apart pretty quick. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll show you the ultimate end. It's kind of funny. In fact, they were going to have the hotel uh, restored and, and, and put together by a concessionaire. Do you notice 1983? And uh, 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 it, it, before they could do it, a giant boulder fell on the building. <laughs> and so, uh, Marvin Browdy, who is right there, looks a little like Dukakis. They put him on the bulldozer and kind of drove him around into the building because he wanted to be part of it, uh, 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 pulling it down. So, okay, so here, there's... This shot is in 1940. It's the year 1940. You see the canyon before it starts to disappear. Uh, right here, oops, right there, that's where the park goes. Okay, that's Palisades Recreation right there. Downtown Pacific Palisades, right there. The, the business block is right there. You're st starting to see that these are starting to be filled in lifts. Here, this is about 1936, is that is monument. Right there is a vestige part of the canyon, right there. So, and uh, this is, uh, 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 is Albright, or is that Albright? No, this is all right. Um, and then right here is the downtown with the, where the fire station is. So little by little, the canyon disappeared. And now in those days, they didn't have big compactors. This is big knuckle bars, you know, that they run around and on, at the, on the back of a, a, a bulldozer. Uh, what they would do is fill it in and wait seven years. Just about right. I think, I think it's stable. <laughs> so, I want to show you, this is in 1940, exactly the same time. Okay, right here was going to be the lake. Uh, uh, Crusoeville is right here, coming off here. Right there. And this was going to be the lake. Well, Everybody forgot about the lake. <laughs> that was a goner. So very soon after that, that, that this uh, uh, was filled in. Also, everything started to move. And they could see it. We had a big flood in 1938. And 
it, it started the slopes moving. What they did is they put all the drains going into Potrero Canyon and it created these huge blowouts. And so the upper hillside started to move. Also, where do you put your garbage? <laughs> this, is, this is at village school. Yeah, where do I put? Oh, pfft, right into Potrero. Well, everybody started to really get down anybody for doing that. But you know, there's a lot of this still left in there. Now, there was a wonderful family. These are actually kind of the shakers and movers. To the left is Martha Patterson. She owned uh, uh, the, 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 the canyon with her husband. Uh, this is uh, her second husband, uh, Mr. Winnegar. Above is the guy who owned every single gas station. This is Jack Sauer. He owned, e there were nine, nine gas stations in town. It was gas station heaven. There was always like a pall of, of, of you know, smoke and, and a whole bunch of gas stations. Uh, over here was uh, the man who made the newspaper. Uh, uh, um, now I, I'm blocking on the same. So I have my crib sheet here. See, I, I can't. Now I'll, I'll, it'll hit, it'll hit, it'll hit. And, and that's why I wrote it down because it's Telford work. He, he, he was the man who started the, started the newspaper. Okay. Now. Mr. Patterson liked to collect weird stuff. <laughs> so the, if people, he, he for example, would have a lot of like Packards, you know, old beat up Packards. And, uh, but he also, uh, um, he collected airplane parts and, and also pieces of house. His house was like a Beverly Hills mansion that would been torn down, but he kept kind of part of it and built his house out of it. So he was kind of this eccentric genius. Everybody loved him. He was a neat guy. And Martha was, you know, a good member of the Methodist church. And um, what happens is, is she loved the story so much, she did a book called The Backyard Bomber. And uh, uh, Jeff, Jeff, uh, he sells, you know, old books. Uh, he, he has, you have copies of this, don't you? I do. Yeah, see? I get a commission, don't I? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so she wrote this book. It's actually a neat little tale of an eccentric family. Okay, so the houses started to move. And uh, uh, this is on DePa. And it is, uh, it, and, and so uh, I knew the people who lived in this. You know them too. Peter Graves. And Joan Graves told the neatest story. She'd go, well, you know, the place was starting to move. And, you know, it, it, Peter didn't care. What, what we did was we put tape on the windows and, and uh, bricks uh, under the bed every once in a while. She said it took about two weeks, and then we have to put another brick under the end of the bed. <laughs> that's so good. <laughs> well, that's... You know, now they just say, we're sending our attorney over, man. <laughs> and so they, at the same time, were starting to build the park. Um, and the community had really pressed to have uh, a recreation center. And so what they did is they got the, the parcel was purchased by the, the city. And they started filling. Um, they started to grade out the areas for both the tennis courts are over here. And then over here is the baseball diamonds. And so uh, this started a process of having a really nice park. What year was that? Uh, this 1950, the year 1950. So again, piles of dirt. Pacific pile of dirt. <laughs> and they filled in 
<laughs> that's worth more. By the way, I think these were bitchin' buildings. I, 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 I like the scale, you know? And, and, you know, now it's Disneyland. So, but, but kind of the hobby of everybody is to see how many cracks were breaking out into the slope. And you, you can see that this is over by Via de los Olas. And it, it became a major problem until 1958 was a killer slide. And this is after a long process. Now, I'm kind of building up to kind of a, uh, my civic kind of fury type thing. My, my civic fury is, just let the slopes go. You were stupid enough to buy a house on the rim of the canyon. <laughs> ah, but I get ahead of myself. So, here uh, is Pacific Coast Highway, right there. And, uh, uh, okay, let's, let's go, we, we, we get the action shots here. Um, and what, what the, this uh, Caltrans decided was, gosh, we better move that pile of dirt. <laughs> Not a good idea. In fact, the, the superintendent was there and was declaring, I think we're about done when the slide went again and killed him. Uh, that's why it's called the killer slide. And boy, famous last words. I, I think it's done. So uh, uh, they had to do something. So what they did is they moved it. There's the old road. New one. And if you notice, they groined uh, and, and built the sand up. Um, what happens is, is this area where it's bulldozer playland now is uh, one of the most complex ownerships uh, and very difficult to figure out which entity owns what. And so, uh, um, now, uh, this uh, uh, guy, uh, <laughs> his name is Pardee, and he is a geologist. And he became kind of like the celebrity in town. And because in 1958, after that happened, federal money went into a major geological survey of the whole area. They studied all the way from Castle Mar all the way to Santa Monica Canyon. And the maps are accurate. That is Mr. Pardee there, and what is he pointing at? Remember I talked about chalk line, you know, with dead bodies and things? That's a fault. That is an active fault. And so, in the, on the right-hand side is, is uh, uh, the sunspot, which is right under a fault. <laughs> in fact, this area, that in this magazine, this is the magazine where it has their 50 geologically interesting areas in the United States. And they said, it's not because it's beautiful, it's because it's been studied for oil, for landslides, for lawsuits. It has had more core holes in it that it can shake a stick at. So, here more and more you can see, more and more there's grading now, the canyon's over, over there. This is, but you're noticing how they're filling all the canyons. All of them. At this same time, Las Pulgas, Goplin was filling Las Pulgas, which is a dangerous fill, because what they did is he put in some fill, and he said, oh, he would charge guys who had too big a load of concrete. Bring it over here. Oh, well, we'll put a couple of pieces of plywood out, just fill it up in between, and we'll call it a dam. 
uh, when it was uh, evaluated that they wanted to have a park made there, and the evaluation was negative $10 million. And it's because of the liability. Okay, next. At the same time, we have one of, environmentally, one of the best city councilmen you could ever have. You're sort of a goofy guy. <laughs> uh, uh, Marvin Browdy to the right. He's about to shoot some surfers. And, <laughs> and so, but Marvin, he had a great deputy by the name of Cindy Misikowski. And she was a powerhouse. And the one who actually has had more to form how to save as much as possible. She was, uh, knew how to talk to all the city agencies. Because we we're going to turn all the canyons into this. Uh, this is the fill for uh, the um, Pali uh, uh, High. So even the uh, editorial started to come in like, what are we doing? Martha Patterson, who owned uh, uh, Petrero Canyon, had said, why don't we make a golf course out of it? Which actually makes pretty good sense. The city didn't want them to because the liability was so much that in 1959, they basically said, we're not going to allow you to fill it. And so what they did is they bought, the city bought them out, but they bought it out for the park. <laughs> no, this created a massive problem. So, of course, the canyon, after a, a big rain in 1980, they had to fill the thing in. But they couldn't even do that in a straightforward way. In 1977, they had a, a, a plan for, oh, 100,000 cubic yards. We, we all did everything in yards. And then it went to a million cubic yards, and then to 7 million <laughs> yards. It was creeping expansionism on a surreal level. And each time, Everybody go, huh? Oh, when are you going to get done? Next week. <laughs> so, you know, it was always, oh. And so this la-la happened. Well, the, this plan, this is where I got caught into the net. I was chairman of the community council because, here I'll show you. Okay. Now, this is, this is, as if you're on acid and have been asked to do the project. What it is, right here are two, this is right down the middle of the canyon, it's a cross section. Two 20 foot wide roads underneath a fake stream is a, that's two feet, the, the little liner, it sounds like, oh, we just put a little piece of plastic down. No. It's concrete, and it's underneath, it's two feet. Then, on top of that, see there's a stream, it says freshwater marsh. Well, where are you going to get the water? This is where I went freaky doodles. Well, gosh, during the summer, which is all the time here, would have been 100,000 gallons a day of potable water that came from wherever. So this sounded kind of stupid. I said, well, why did you do that? Well, the city attorney told us we had to. Why is the city attorney the engineer on this? Because the city got sued. So. <laughs> it, 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 the, and all of us knew that was BS. Number one, they couldn't get enough fill. There was a recession going on at that time, so they had trouble getting fill. On top of that, they, uh, uh, the plans kept on changing. 
On top of that, it, nobody could, could kind of settle on exactly. This is where we put to, uh, Marvin Brady, really Cindy Misikowski, knew we were in trouble. Okay, so they put together uh, the car, uh, uh, Marvin Browdy's task force. Now, if you notice, the task force on parks and playing fields. Well, everybody, you know, kind of like blind men feeling this park. The Palisades has more parkland than almost any part of Los Angeles. On top of that, it has a lot of facilities. A lot of them are private. So what happens is, is that everybody went, I want this. It was, I, I want a, a 50 meter swimming pool. Okay, there, that's a good wish. Uh, now, oh, oh, we want, you know, 10 more playing fields, you know. It was, it was like Santa Claus time. So, what happens is, is every canyon became kind of this battleground. So this is Los Leones, for example. Um, the, uh, 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 we planted a tree. I don't live anywhere near this place, but what every piece of open land became important to save. And this is a canyon that had been denatured. We had suggested that they take the riparian, the stream that was to go through Potrero, and put it in uh, Los Leones. There's a big reason why. It's habitat restoration. Habitats for the animals, not the bushes. And what happens is, is the animals really are brown Potrero or puppy dogs and kitty cats. And uh, to have, you know, the, the, the natural, you know, flow of habitat, well, they, the, 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 the city didn't care. Well, we have to put it back habitat. I said it'd be cheaper if you had a limousine take the animals to the canyon and take them back. And they agreed with me. Ha! Ah, by the way, the, um, uh, the people here are significant. Uh, this is Rita D'Alessio. She was chairman of the task force. Jay Shields here. This is Lamont Johnson. Barbara Manaw, and this is a long-haired hippie guy. Okay, so we would go off. This picture is very important to me because the uh, uh, geologist, the guy by the name of John Byers, is right there. Okay, we, we were going on fact-finding things. So we were in the middle of Petrero. This is Petrero Canyon. And they're filling it, and it, it looking pretty grim. And so it had been just after a huge rain. And so we're, we're kind of there, and, he, uh, and we have, we're all kind of like bickering. And so he says, uh, yeah, could you, could you just move, move a little further over? And we did, and a little shotgun sound. They're what we call mud slugs. They're these big hunks of mud that slide down in a very precipitous manner toward people. The thing splatted right in front of us, and I turned to the geologist and I said, good call. <laughs> I think probably some of the city people had planned it and wanted to kill us. Uh, I sent up a proposal, and it was kind of funny, sort of what I've said, hey, you know, put, put the riparian where it's going to do some good, and, you know, just... Uh, make the, the, for example, the baseball field. The kids all had to wear batting helmets. A home run in one field would cross over into the other and hit the kid in the back of the head. So I said, why don't you expand the fields? Just, but uh, just expand it and at the same time put in a sound barrier for the neighborhood. Wow. <laughs> now, th this isn't genius. It's just common sense. Well, this is where they start to list these things. And we told them, don't use city water to, you know, potable water. 
And why do you have two 20-foot wide roads? The fire department wants it. Well, can't you have a 13-foot wide road? And one? And so these are all, all of these, if we made actually a reasonable request, it was put and actually implemented. And so I, 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 everybody hated me. I was the most hated man in town because I kind of gave both sides kind of a and, uh, uh, but it turned out, I have to tell you, the process was good. The people who I felt were, you know, too protective of the neighborhood became expert in this. So there was a, a woman by the name, Barbara Brager, who really became quite expert and, and was, were important in the negotiating process. And what happened was, even though we didn't get the, the money or whatever for Los Leones, the idea of having a restoration was then taken by the government officials and okayed. And we had volunteers, we called them glamazons because they were almost all women. The only people, guys are talking about tools all the time. Well, I'd use, I'd, I'd use a big D9 bulldozer on that. Whereas the women would just get it done. <laughs> what do you want? And they, they planted, uh, most of the trees in Los Leones are planted by volunteers. And the planning was done within, the, the difference between, okay, I'm going to go over uh, prices here. The cost that has been in Petrero is about 100 million. Uh-huh. This canyon, where we did uh, uh, the restoration, we, we got the rocks as they fell into Pacific Coast Highway and asked the contractor, could you, could you dump them here? And is uh, uh, all, everything, including the stream, uh, three parking lots, two bathrooms uh, in a two phase, has been about 800,000. Okay. Um, it, it's more sensible. And so this is almost from the exact same location. And, and, and does run, a, the, it, it ran as a stream this last. Okay, what happens is, is when you get, this is this teamwork of people. There's Joe Edmiston there, looking a little like Beethoven. And uh, the Dan Priest, uh, TCA, this is, uh, and then over here is Bob Locker uh, from um, PPRA, and that's Rita D'Alessio, who left the community and became the head of the uh, uh, Sierra Club in the Carmel area. So what happens is, is we all kind of buried the proverbial hatchet and got into planning. Planning's all the, the basis for making negotiations. And, and it's where you get our body, because people have a tendency just to go, oh, what I want for Christmas Santa thing. So I'm going to kind of end on this, because I, my part ended about 2000, uh, the year 2000. And I got so burned out. It just got to be too much. But there were several people who took over that did an even better job and finished it off. Dave Card, one is Dave Card, George Wolfberg, and uh, Gil Denbo. Gil, are you here? That. No, these, they, they took over and they kind of pulled the park together. They negotiated they, and the park, how many have visit, have walked it? Isn't that great? I think it's one of the best walking parks. Now you have to project, you can see here, Los Leones just look like a big mud pile. And it really came together. What I'm going to very, very, very strongly urge, and this is, I was told, I had one of the city people sidled up to me and he said, you know, the community, we, c we are not, as the city, will never be able to take care of it properly. And we put together joint power authorities 
on several of the projects I work on. They're very important and can empower the community to take care of things and in partnership and go for grants and things like that. And this is where the energy of this community should be. It should not be on complaint. It should be on working on solutions. The canyon's there. And so what I'm going to do is open it up to the floor. We're going to have a few moments of question and answer. And you know you can see I give snotty remarks. So you may get something good here. So are there, uh, do you have a question? Anybody have a question? Yes. Um, are the instability of the houses that fell into the canyon, are you saying that that came from poorly engineered fill? Or was it from a blue line in the canyon and underwater spring? Yeah. What the geology, remember I said that it had the one of the 50 most interesting? What it is, it's all alluvium that's underneath. Uh, and it's not, uh, the, the initial, the, the most of the houses going down were on not man-made fill. Uh, there is a clay layer that's about six inches thick, and it's all over the palisades. And uh, in fact, the geologists call it palisades powder. <laughs> you will see where they have drilled uh, uh, test holes, and this blue layer will come up. And what it does, it slicks. It, it, it keeps the water up, and then it slides on it. The geology is very, very difficult. And, th that's th and, th and the clay layer is one of the biggies. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Yes. Um, whatever happened with the Caruso filter? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> 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 What happened was, uh, it's several things. Okay, what, the, what it is, what happened to the Caruso fill dirt? Yes, it did end up in the canyon. Now, what happens is, is the laundry, Emerson's laundry, uh, had a tough time keeping their toxics from going into the ground. So there's a plume underneath uh, the uh, you know where the old stream channel that went right down the old stream channel and so what happens is is that when they were digging it out they supposedly had a monitor that would have what is good soil and bad soil number two how did Caruso get the idea it's a lot cheaper maybe that had something to do to just move it down the canyon a little bit. Um, the soil was deemed to not be viable for restoration. So it was moved up the canyon and then scraped out with those giant scrapers. And it's deposited at the right next to PCH. Does that answer your question? <laughs> there we go. And it, whether it's toxic or not, I don't know. Okay, any other questions? Okay. How did it come to be named George Wolfberg Park? Uh, it's because many people who were involved uh, were, uh, um, uh, felt it w he was extremely important, and I agree with that. He really, he used to be, I think it was in the Bureau of the Budget of uh, the City of Los Angeles. He knew the ins and outs. And as a retiree, he was very active and probably key in getting this thing done. And I, I, I think if it weren't for him, this would not be done. Be, between Dave Card, Gil Denbo, but Wolfberg knew how to be an asshole. <laughs> I mean that in the nicest way. You don't get any place unless you're really mean. Good for you, George. And I, 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 I think 
it, it would be 20 years away from being completed without him. Okay? Sorry. Uh, one more. I want to uh, highlight Noah Fleischman over here. Uh, he was with Bonin's office and was totally cool. And uh, I, we, we, just like Cindy Misikowski, you need great, great people in, in, in the staff's office of the city councilman. It's where the rubber meets the road in politics for us. So I thank you very much. And so now you'll never come to another historical society <laughs> event. <laughs> Take care. I think of a three Randy Young knocked it out of the park this year. Well. <laughs> for joining us this evening. Uh, on your way out, we have some light refreshments in the lobby, including some genuine biscotti. Please indulge. Uh, and again, a reminder, along with the uh, Palisades Historical Blanket and the uh, Centennial Magazine, and as you'll recall, Mr. Ham from Will Rogers, would love to talk to you if you have any interest in being a docent. So please enjoy the rest of your evening. Have a safe trip home. And... Uh, your Pacific Palisades Historical Society hopes to see you again soon. Have a good night.